Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Untold with Heidi Buzo. In this episode, we will be focusing on the Maduro regime's role in facilitating drug trafficking, narco-terrorism, and its involvement with terrorist organizations such as Hezbollah. And now we learned also Hamas. Not a surprise. We will be talking about Hezbollah's designations as a terrorist organization in European countries and also the implications of that. Um, we, uh, we have a lot to talk about. We are joined today by Elon Berman, a senior vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council in Washington, D.C., who is also an expert on regional security in the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Russian Federation. We are also joined by a great expert on these subjects, uh, Joseph Humeyer, who's the director for the Center for Secure and Free Society. He is a global security expert specializing on trans-regional threats in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you so much both for joining us today. Good to be here. You both wrote a book together. I want to start by talking about this book because it does focus on these issues. Whoever wants to start to tell us a little bit more about that Iranian infiltration in uh, Central and South America? Well, let me start and uh, I'll sort of do the outside and Joseph can do the inside. So uh, fairness in advertising, we didn't write the book, we co-edited the book, we have lots of regional experts um, that we commissioned to do different chapters looking at Iran's strategic footprint in various countries around the region because we were trying uh, to answer a very simple question and, and Joseph and I have known each other for a long time and I specialize in Middle Eastern affairs. Uh, he specializes in Latin American affairs. And the nexus between those two things, the presence of Iran and also other radical Islamic actors in Latin America has, is something that's occupied both of us for a long time. So the question that we were trying to answer, um, which culminated in the book, but it really started as part of a series of trips that Joseph and I took together to various places, to Brazil and to Nicaragua and, and to uh, Panama and, and Colombia and Bolivia, um, was really to take a look, a firsthand look on the ground at what that presence actually looks like. What, uh, you know, we, we heard at the time a lot in Washington about Iran penetrating the Western Hemisphere, Iran, uh, you know, being shut out of global markets and therefore coming to America's, uh, what, you know, what people call America's geopolitical backyard. But there hadn't been a lot of people who had traveled down there and taken a look. And so uh, Joseph and I had a crazy idea that, that we would do that. Um, and that started a uh, sort of a years long research inquiry that both of us have uh, did and both of us have maintained, but it also resulted in a book called Iran's Strategic Penetration of Latin America, uh, which in which we try to unpack this a little bit and explain the contours. So, mm -hmm. Joseph, take it away. Yeah, no, I think uh, no. Everything Elon said that's exactly what happened. Actually, I met Elon at uh, in Congress at uh, a congressional debates, and, and mm -hmm. he was actually testifying. I believe it was in 2011 over a hearing at the Department of Homeland Security. So that's the kind of the context. There's a there was a series of congressional debates probably since 2010, 11 all the way to 2015, uh, during the period of which uh, many things were happening in relation to Iran, U.S. foreign policy, U.S. national security. This includes the debate over the nuclear agreement, this is the JCPOA. This also includes uh, debates over Hezbollah and, and their involvement in narco trafficking. So in that period of time, in, the, in that body of time between 2010 and 2015, uh, Latin America wasn't widely considered a big part of that debate. Uh, but there were small little breadcrumbs, anecdotes that you would hear with Venezuela or with Bolivia. And so exactly what Elon said, we, we decided to go down there. And I think what kind of fast forwarding to the book, uh, the book was published in 2014. So it's a, it's a little bit uh, dated now, we probably want to update it at some point. But the, the, what was important about the book was me and Elon could have written this together. Like he's a very prolific writer, much more prolific than I am. And, and I could have added my two cents and we could have had it done probably in a few months. It took a little longer even just to write and publish the book because we didn't, we, wanted, we didn't want the voice to come from just uh, two more Americans that have seen a particular threat network and are trying to advocate this to policymakers here in the US, but we wanted the voice to come from Latin Americans, uh, to say that uh, Latin Americans see this as a challenge for their own countries, not to mention that one of these countries was bombed by Iran and Hezbollah many years ago, being Argentina. Mm -hmm. Argentina. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. So they, we wanted them to project this voice into the United States and us to help them uh, truly understand that Iran is uh, not just a, a U.S. threat, uh, 
it's a hemispheric threat and, or as Alan reminds me all the time, it's a global threat. And I think that was the purpose of the book was to give the voice to Latin Americans to make sure they could uh, say very clearly and articulately that uh, Iran is a problem even in places where you wouldn't expect it to be. Now we know that at Venezuela is a country where is very infiltrated by the Iranian regime and its allies. But in, in terms of other countries in Latin America, where is Iran today versus when you guys wrote the book? Well, no, go ahead, Joseph. I, I think it was an, it's an interesting question because it has changed even from when we were down there uh, mm-hmm. in uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, and the footprint is getting bigger. And so the only thing I would throw in here, and Joseph can give you the details, but the, the thing that I think is necessary to understand from a strategic perspective is there's a, there's a temptation on the part of American policymakers to uh, use or to look at Iran's penetration of Latin America as a uh, Ahmadinejad venture, essentially as as a foreign policy project that was spearheaded by the Iranian president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad because he had good personal relations with Hugo Chavez, who was the Venezuelan strongman at the time. And so both, uh, both gentlemen have left the political scene. Ahmadinejad has retired, Hugo Chavez has passed. And so there's a temptation to, among policymakers in Washington to say, this isn't really an issue, but there's a lot of reasons to uh, sort of to keep uh, an eye on this strategic problem because from the Iranian perspective, there is very clearly a continued emphasis on a hemispheric presence. And I think that's present on the ground, right, Joseph? No, absolutely, and I think, um... Yeah, so I mean, to contextualize the understanding of Iran's presence in Latin America, it started at the dawn of the revolution. In 1979, when uh, the Islamic Revolution took place in Iran, uh, when the Ayatollahs came to power, they made a quick calculation very at the beginning, which was that they weren't going to be limited by borders, that they didn't want this to just be uh, a national movement uh, or even a regional movement. Obviously, it started with uh, their ambitions in the Middle East, but I think Iran looks at themselves as a global power. And in order to build that global capacity, they looked at far places, even such as Latin America back in that period, throughout the 80s. Uh, that was evidence in the 90s when we saw the bombings in Argentina. But so this has been going on for a tremendous amount of time. And what it's graduated into is, uh, you know, to your question, Ivy, is it's everywhere in Latin America. I mean, there is no country that, in Latin America that I know about, and I look at the region very closely, that does not have at least a semblance of an Iranian or proxy presence in there. Now, it, gra- it, it, it differentiates on the level of presence. There's 11 countries in Latin America that have an embassy, so they have a formal relationship with Iran. Uh, but there's many countries that don't have a formal relationship with Iran. Nonetheless, there's proxy elements that are either being financed, funded, or supported by Iran uh, in a way that allows the Iran to have a foothold even in those countries. I'll give you an example of that. Peru is a good, great example for looking at this threat because Peru doesn't have an Iranian embassy in it uh, ostensibly, but its neighboring countries do, meaning Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, and Ecuador. So there's four Iranian embassies around Peru. And what you see in Peru is you see a tremendous Iranian enabled network, but not through Islamist movements, but through historic uh, separatist movements that have been at the Southern part of Peru that have been looking to challenge the Peruvian government over many, many years. Uh, So what you see is Iran started to fund these separatist movements, radicalize them, bring them into the fold of the Iranian revolution, and then create their own culture centers and their their, their presence more, more, more directly. Uh, and then that combines with Hezbollah. Hezbollah has uh, had a convergence with uh, organized crime and drug trafficking. Peru is one of the three major producers of cocaine in South America. Uh, and so Hezbollah has been coming into the fold in Peru as well. So I think, you know, even in countries where you don't see a formal presence of Iran, you still see Iran in many, in many ways, just like in the Middle East, where you see uh, Iranian proxies uh, operating all throughout the Middle East. Uh, the only difference in Latin America, the proxies aren't necessarily Islamic, but they're uh, anti-American, they're anti-Israel, uh, or as they call- Like the Farks, for example? Well, the Farks are a historic partner of mostly Hezbollah, that you know, 50, 60 year old insurgency that uh, Hezbollah has used to be able to get, get a foothold in Colombia. Small little anecdote on that, uh, you know, the bombing that we've been talking about, the 1994 bombing of the Amia Cultural Center in Buenos Aires, the explosives for that attack uh, were curried through Colombia into the tribe border area, which is the uh, intersection of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. Uh, th- those explosives that were curried through Colombia were facilitated by the FARC. This is according to the Argentine intelligence who investigated the Amia bombing at the time. So that, that goes back many years to 1994, 
that uh, relationship has only matured since then. Going to Venezuela recently, uh, a person named Adel Al Zabiar, who is a Syrian born Venezuelan. Um, who worked with Maduro and other high-level Venezuelan officials was charged with narco-terrorism, drug trafficking, and weapons offenses. Um, and he was charged by a Manhattan federal court. Tell us a little bit more about this case. Yeah, so the context of this case is that in the middle of March of this year, the Department of Justice uh, released or unsealed uh, 15 indictments on high-ranking members of the Maduro regime, including Nicolas Maduro. Uh, these indictments were all related to narco-terrorism. Uh, they're all related to a, a specific cartel within the Venezuelan regime, which they call the Sons Cartel, or in Spanish, we Cartel de los Soles, because it's based on the insignia of the military generals. Uh, it's a military-run cartel that's used to traffic cocaine uh, all throughout the world and Venezuela being one of the most important uh, transit countries uh, for cocaine. The way they describe uh, these indictments is not as using cocaine simply as an illicit activity to enrich the drug traffickers, but as a weapon of war to uh, flood, literally a quote unquote flood, this is what Attorney General Barr said, flood the United States with cocaine to destroy the fabric of American society. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it with, from that perspective, then you, know, you could understand a little bit why Iran or Hezbollah would want to get involved aside from specific illicit uh, uh, financial uh, gains that they can get from that transaction. Um, and so going to the, this most recent, with this most recent indictment, and if you read this indictment, it, it reads like a movie script. I mean, it reads with uh, clandestine meetings in Syria, in Lebanon, in Caracas, uh, the movements of drugs for weapons, uh, AT4 rockets coming into Venezuela, those being spread out through the FARC into other countries in Latin America. So it reads like this movie script, but if you put this into context, there's a, a, a theory within the defense doctrine that's been emerging called convergence. And what convergence is, is simply the uh, union of transnational criminal organizations and international terrorist groups. What some people thought would never happen because they have different objectives. One is more political, the other is more criminal. But what we've seen is the connection between the two groups isn't necessarily uh, strategic. It's uh, uh, in many ways logistical. Uh, they share the same accountants, they share the same networks, they share the same technicians. And so that's where Venezuela comes in. Venezuela has become the central hub of the logistical network for both terrorists, such as Hezbollah and Hamas, and also cartels and criminals such as Los Zetas in Sinaloa in Mexico. So that, that's where Venezuela, Venezuela provides state support to both these activities and by extension brings these activities together. That last indictment shows some of the details of that, but it falls within the bigger picture of what we've been seeing uh, with crime and terror convergence throughout many years. I think there's- a, Yes, I was gonna ask you, Elon, go ahead. No, no, I, I think there's, uh, Joseph is making a critical point because uh, you are seeing this convergence, but the convergence is layered on top of what is a very permissive security environment. And, and this is sort of the, the, uh, a region that is, uh, you know, historically has trended anti-American, has, uh, you know, a, a proliferation of leftist regimes was the environment, the fertile soil that allowed Iran and also uh, uh, radical non-state actors to move around in that region. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a lot of question marks still uh, among American policymakers about, uh, you know, how is Iran able to move around in the region? How, what are Iran's objectives? But uh, they're much more understandable when they're layered on top of a foundation that these are uh, permissive, uh, sort of, uh, in many cases, anti-American regimes that uh, they don't, uh, even if they don't necessarily actively court the partnership, they, they don't, they're not uh, preventing the partnership. And this is the environment in which that convergence has flourished. Uh, it's an environment that has allowed these uh, non-responsible stakeholders uh, in the inter international system to advantage themselves, to um, allow uh, criminal organizations allow extremist organizations to move around. Uh, and that's why there's so much interest by Iran, but also by Iranian proxies in the Western Hemisphere. In Venezuela, the regime itself is an umbrella. The regime itself is a facilitator to all of these criminal and terrorist activities in the region. What are the implications, in your opinion, I'm going to start with you, Ilan, and then with Joseph, of having these charges against individuals who are working directly with Maduro, for example, and the Iranian regime and Hezbollah and Hamas? 
Sure. Well, I, Joseph and I have had this conversation many, many times. So uh, at the risk of stealing his thunder, what I no, no, the, the way I would describe it is that uh, Venezuela is very much a proxy conflict. Uh, it is a conflict where Iran uh, is spending a tremendous amount of uh, political capital, but also economic capital to keep the Maduro regime afloat. Uh, but so is China and so is Russia. And the reason they're doing that, the reason they're investing so much in Maduro remaining in power is because a unreformed uh, sort of slow moving political crisis in Venezuela is something that saps American attention. It's something that saps uh, uh, American resources. And it's also something that creates a vortex of instability in Latin America that perpetuates that permissive environment that we were talking about. Joseph. Yeah, so I think, um, no, what Ilan says, right, this is, this is a proxy, much like Syria is a proxy conflict, uh, much like Yemen is a proxy conflict, Venezuela has become that new frontier, but it's outside the Middle East, so it has some different dimensions. Um, I think, let me, let me backtrack a little bit, uh, have you, if you allow me to, kind of give some context as to where the origin of this is. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time in Latin America, and we did a lot of work at my center at researching the kind of the Middle Eastern networks, and, and more importantly, the Middle Eastern history behind what's been going on in Latin America and how this is combined because the two regions that ostensibly you would think are very different and, and very far apart. Like there isn't a whole lot of trade relations. There isn't a whole lot of uh, commercial cultural relations. Uh, but nevertheless, when you do the history, you do the homework, you start to realize there's more than what we think. Um, uh, let me start with uh, these trips I've taken recently to Chile and uh, uh, Brazil and Colombia, where I work with uh, different, uh, well, I try to help some of the leaders in those countries understand the Iranian threat or understand the Middle Eastern network. So I start by telling them a story. So I want to tell you the story and, and I want to see how you can tie this, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the story starts with a lieutenant colonel uh, who had high uh, political ambitions and tried to capture his country but by force, but failed through a coup, uh, only later to be elected. Uh, he was elected president and immediately used his natural resources, particularly petroleum, to uh, fund a, a revolution first internally in his country, then regionally uh, throughout his neighborhood. Uh, this colonel turned president, Lieutenant Colonel turned president, died after 14 years of office uh, of natural causes, but not before leaving a legacy of crime, corruption, and conflict. So I tell that story anywhere in Latin America, particularly in these countries, Brazil and Colombia, and they'll look at me like, Joseph, I got you at I had you at hello. This, this was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hugo Chavez. We know, we've heard the story. I was like, no, I stop him. I say, no, that's Lieutenant Colonel Gamilla del Nasser. So why is the story of Nasser identical to the story of Hugo Chavez? Because mm -hmm. there's history and migration that ties the Middle East, particularly to South America, that hasn't been uh, 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 studied carefully to understand how this, or how this origin has created places as uh, 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 unique as the tri-border area in the south of South America, the, what I was talking about, the connection of Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. So in the case of Venezuela, this history very briefly has three periods of mass migration, 1880, 1910, and uh, 1960 to 70. So what happened here is you have a uh, mass migration that happened for three different things, the Ottoman uprising, uh, the Armenian genocide, and then the rise of the Syrian dictators and the pan-Arab nationalist movements in the Middle East. And what this did was created a refugee route that went from the Middle East to South America. And within that refugee route, what tends to happen with refugee routes, they get exploited by adversaries and created rat lines. So in uh, Venezuela, there is a rat line that was established more than uh, 60 years ago that is being operationalized increasingly by the Chavez then Maduro regime to create what is truly a trans-regional threat network that can move not just people, but products, weapons, drugs, or what name it. Uh, but this rat line was established many years ago. So there is a Middle Eastern dimension, even to the rise of Hugo Chavez, that people didn't understand prior to uh, his ascension to power. That's very um, an interesting point that you just brought. Um, but going back to the implications, and I just want to also kind of talk a little bit about this. So this is a cartel, right? This is called a Cartel de los Soles. Yeah. Is that how you pronounce it, Joseph? It. And they are now being charged for working with uh, designated terrorist organizations, including Hezbollah, Hamas, mm -hmm. and the FARC. Um, I, I just want to know a little bit more about the implications of this and where does Hamas come to the picture? Because uh, to me, as somebody who is watching uh, this as it unfolds, 
we know the connection between Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Iranian regime and the Assad regime. But to have Hamas going all the way to Venezuela, this is new. It isn't. It isn't. Hamas, uh, for example, the, the Palestinian uh, authorities have one of their only embassies that's recognized in the world in Brazil. Uh, so they've been able to have a diplomatic presence in Latin America for many years. Uh, they have been able to use uh, their uh, diplomatic presence to establish networks, much like uh, and they do in the Middle East, and have those networks, as we talked about before, tied to other criminal networks that are existing in the region. Uh, one of the things I think maybe to, to kind of uh, elucidate this a little bit is a lot of the divisions, the uh, religious and ethnic uh, divisions that we see in the Middle East, particularly with Sunni Shia uh, uh, divisions, you don't see those as clearly in South America or in Latin America. Uh, one of the explanations that, they, that is I think they're so far away from the conflict. Uh, they're, they're very far away from all the, the fighting that's happening in the Middle East. And when they come into Latin America, uh, they're few and far between. So they tend to uh, unify a bit more. We've seen cases, I know Ilan and I have been into different countries where we've seen cases where you talk to uh, one convert, or a Latin convert that uh, converted to Islam, and, and uh, one day he, 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 you would ask him about Sunni Islam, and the next day you would ask him about Shia Islam, and they really don't know the difference. Uh, and so they don't really distinguish between this, and that has uh, allowed uh, Sunni groups to work, and, and maybe not strategically, but at least tactically in concert with Shia groups, which are mostly uh, facilitated by Hezbollah. So uh, Hamas comes into the picture much like Al Qaeda has come to the picture in the past, where they have just become networks that are useful to Iran to be able to uh, build out its capabilities in the in the region. No, and, and I think yeah. that's a that's a critical point um, because uh, if you look at Latin America demographically, you would think that this is not a permissive environment. Uh, for Islamic radical groups and for Iran, right? It's 96% uh, Catholic. Um, there is not a lot of understanding of the differences between Sunnis and Shiites, right? Joseph and I uh, have had those conversations where people look at us like we're uh, slightly strange or crazy when we ask them sort of, you know, which sect do you belong to? Because uh, Islam is an alternative identity, sort of an anti-state identity that people uh, have begun to adopt and it's increasingly popular. And that's why um, when policymakers in Washington look at what Iran is doing in Latin America, uh, they get, very often they get confused. You know, what could Iran possibly do? How could Iran possibly move the needle in terms of its strategic objectives in a region that's 96% Catholic, that really doesn't have any affinity for Islamic history, Islamic culture? But the reality is that layered on top of those migration lines that Joseph talked about is a very deep indigenous sort of culture of resistance. You have a lot of failed states, you have a lot of underperforming regimes. And when you have discontented citizenry, they're looking for an alternative identity. And so when you see Iran, when you see Hamas, Al Qaeda and others move around in the region, the reason they're able to do that is because they're tapping into that dissent wave. If I wanna go back and talk about now the situation in Venezuela, and the fact that the Iranian regime is continuing to be able to send oil shipments. And we saw the recent oil shipments that were sent to Venezuela, and they were not stopped by the United States. Many were hoping that this will happen. Now those ships probably will be on their way back. And we don't know if anything will be done about this. But why are we not seeing an American action to stop the Iranian regime from being able to support directly the Maduro regime with oil. Uh, sure. Let me let me can I, can I say one point just to round up. Oh yes, go ahead. About the Iranian nexus in Latin America, and then I'll, I promise I'll talk about the the oil tankers. Um, what one of the things I think is important to consider is how Iran sells themselves in Latin America, like how they present themselves. It's very different than how they do so in the Middle East, you know, where they do get into the, the religious connotations and they do get into the ethnic divisions. In Latin America, they kind of abandon that to some level. Not completely, they do still do their, their proselytization and, and, and their, 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 uh, um, they still support Islamist uh, networks. But they also consider themselves the leader of an anti-imperialist movement. And so when they go into Latin America, they talk of themselves, specifically the Iranian revolution, they describe the Iranian revolution as a social movement that was lifted up to protect natural resources with British Petroleum in the case in Iran. And so when you speak like that in Latin America, that opens up a lot of years. It's like, oh, natural resources, we have a bunch of that. Or social movements, we've been doing that for uh, more than a half century. So it, it, it opens up opportunities where you wouldn't think those opportunities exist. And, and it has a lot to do with uh, the salesmanship of Iran. 
when they come to Latin America. So within that, let me let me talk about the tankers. So the, uh, this has been a challenge. This has been a problem, and this is in many ways has been the negligence of uh, U.S. policy on Latin America for decades. Um, the Iranian uh, presence in Venezuela is not new, as we talked about before. Even just without going through all the history, uh, there's at least 15 years under first the Chavez regime, then the Maduro regime, where there's been an IRGC Quds Force presence in Venezuela, done through commercial shipping. It was done through uh, ERISL, Iranian uh, shipping lines, and it was also done through um, uh, their national uh, petrochemical company. Uh, so these, these two elements that ostensibly look as commercial elements established themselves in Venezuela through energy agreements. Uh, Venezuela has an energy, uh, national energy industry called PDVSA, which has essentially become a massive money laundering scheme because it, it no longer really produces petroleum. Uh, that's one of the reasons that these tankers arrived because Venezuela, despite having the largest uh, oil reserves in the world, uh, no longer can actually refine that oil off the ground and so therefore is not usable for the domestic uh, consumption. So in this uh, scenario, Iran has established an infrastructure for 15 years, an infrastructure of under the guise of commercial energy agreements, but uh, beneath the surface of military uh, activity. So uh, that's where the concern for these tankers come in. The tankers uh, decide to come, it's five oil tankers, I believe about approximately 1.5 million barrels of oil, which in the shortages that you're seeing in Venezuela would last weeks at most. Uh, so they decide to come, but the, pro the challenge for the United States is what can we do? Because if you try to intercept those tankers, you, have, you better do it on the Iranian side, because if you do it in international waters, it becomes murky. And if you do it in Venezuela waters, it becomes an act of war. So it, it's very difficult for the United States to engage in that front if there's no precedent for that level of engagement. And we needed to build that precedent many years ago to be able to create uh, kind of an anti-axis strategy around Latin America and, and Venezuela uh, and enforce the Monroe Doctrine. That hasn't been done. And therefore, this administration is kind of put in this very difficult position where they have to you know, either act and, and potentially cause a war or let it happen. Uh, and so what we've seen with these tankers is uh, mostly the propaganda. The propaganda has been at an all-time high. They've been raising the Iranian flag in several buildings in the capital of Caracas. They've been uh, televising the arrival of these tankers as if, you know, this was the, the largest humanitarian assistance that has been ever delivered to Venezuela. The reality is this oil is going to go to Venezuela. It's going to last very little time because most of it's going to go to the regime or to their drug trafficking buddies who also need gas to be able to move narcotics. And then it's going to disappear and the people are going to be in the same situation. But they're going to use this and they have used this as a thumb in the United States eye because they know that that defiance uh, allows them to win brownie points throughout Latin America. And I think that's what they're going for, at least at the short term. Joseph brought a, an important point. What do you think is the right way to kind of handle this type of problem and knowing that just allowing them to continue sending these shipments is not a good option either? Well, okay. So, so I think uh, two main points here. I, I think Joseph is exactly right. Um, this is a huge uh, strategic challenge for the Trump administration. It's something we're not prepared for. Uh, the whole incident in and of itself, I think, is much more noteworthy than most people understand because you have to look at what's happening with regard to Iran itself. Uh, Iran is experiencing something resembling a Chernobyl level event with regard to the coronavirus, right? They, by all indications, the way the virus has hit the Islamic Republic has been much more devastating than what you're seeing on the surface. There's not a lot of uh, information coming out uh, from the regime, but they're now sort of experiencing the, the second wave. Opposition groups are saying that uh, ca actual casualty counts are orders of magnitude higher than what the regime is saying. Um, at the same time, the Iranian economy is getting impacted by uh, the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign. Their foreign exchange reserves are dwindling. So the idea that at this moment in time, the Iranian regime uh, devotes considerable resources to keeping Venezuela and the Maduro regime afloat is, I think, a testament to how much exactly uh, the Iranians see the Venezuelans as a partner, number one, and number two, need Venezuela as an entry point, as a gateway for what they're doing in Latin America. And that's why they're using uh, precious resources at this uh, very perilous time. The second point is, this is a chink in the armor, not only of the United States, but of the international community. Um, 15 years ago, uh, the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration built something uh, 
uh, called the Proliferation Security Initiative, which was intended as a voluntary series of arrangements between countries to uh, do interdiction, to stop vessels, to stop uh, aircraft uh, that, may, that were suspected to be engaged in proliferation, uh, trafficking of uh, weapons of mass destruction and missiles, uh, not oil in and of itself, but it provides a framework for understanding what's necessary now. The unfortunate set of circumstances is though that the Proliferation Security Initiative uh, and mechanisms like it have, are essentially off the table now. There's something that really weren't uh, pursued actively by, um, by the Obama administration and the Trump administration hasn't really revisited the issue. And what that leaves us with is a situation where we actually don't have very many good options in which we can sort of reach out and interdict uh, Iranian ships in international waters, that we can make a sort of a, a non-permissive uh, environment um, in the, the national waters, the territorial waters around Iran. We're not in that position. We're in a less advantageous position now than we were a dozen years ago. So this is something that the administration has to deal with, but there's not a lot of ready tools at their disposal to do it. How big is Hezbollah's role in all of this? Uh, now we know that Hezbollah has been designated a terrorist organization by Germany, Austria, but how involved is Hezbollah in all of this? And what do those designations mean for Hezbollah, knowing that other countries in Latin America have designated Hezbollah a terrorist organization as well? Uh, this has been uh, a tremendous problem in Latin America. I think back to the time when me and Alon were traveling to Latin America and we were going to all these countries and talking about Hezbollah, uh, one of the responses you would get uh, from a lot of countries in Latin America was that Hezbollah isn't necessarily their problem, that they know that they're in the country, they know that they're you know, they might have some cells or they might have some net support networks, but they're, they're not uh, targeting that country. They're not, like if you're uh, Brazil, for instance, you're not uh, targeting the Brazilian government, that they're mostly targeting the United States or, or potentially Israel, uh, the Israeli embassy or some of their networks. So uh, they didn't look at it as their problem. They looked at it as a foreign problem that just happens to be in their territory. Uh, over time, there's been a lot of efforts. I've been involved in these efforts. Alon's been in all these efforts to convince Latin America that this is your problem. Argentina already learned that lesson because they got bombed twice uh, by, by, by Hezbollah. And Hezbollah has been on the move. Uh, one of the ways to convince many of these countries in Latin America was to explain to them not just Hezbollah's role in uh, terrorism, which is for us widely documented and understood, but to explain Hezbollah's role in transnational organized crime. Because for all these countries in Latin America, drug trafficking, uh, money laundering, contraband, smuggling, all that are number one national security threats. They don't have the big picture that we have in the challenges of great power competition with Russia and China, although that's in their country as well. They, but they do see organized crime every day. And a lot of their national security apparatus are designed to fight that. When you let them understand not just how uh, Hezbollah is involved in that, but how Hezbollah has cornered the market in certain money laundering operations in Latin America, they begin to open their eyes. One of the most instrumental of this happened with the Department of Justice. In October of 2018, I believe, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, under then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, they designated Hezbollah as one of the top five transnational criminal organizations in the United States. Just so you get a sense, the other four were three Mexican drug cartels and MS-13, the gang from El Salvador. So Hezbollah, you know, was not Latin. It was the group, is one of the top five transnational uh, criminal organizations in the country. That was a huge message to Latin America to say, this, if you're dealing with all these big drug cartels, well, Hezbollah is a big part of that because as another analyst has said, they have become uh, kind of the FedEx or the Western Union of drug cartels that want to move their illicit products to Middle East or Europe. So uh, fast forward into uh, 2019, uh, this would open up an opportunity to be able to uh, help Latin American governments designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. That was historic effort. That was a, uh, that is something that, uh, let me just explain how important that is in the sense of counterterrorism. We historically have had a challenge in Latin America of helping uh, to have the same language when we're looking at terrorist threats. Very simply, if you were to uh, call uh, any country in Latin America before 2019 and say, uh, uh, the first question would be, do you have any Islamist terrorist cells or networks in your country? All of them would say no. And then you say, you know what? You know, I've had Alon come over and he told me there's some Hezbollah cells in Brazil, uh, I, need to, I need to get more clarification on this. You call back and say, let me be very specific to this Latin American country. Is Hezbollah operating your country? It was, oh yes, Hezbollah does. Do they do terrorism? We thought they were like a counterfeiter or some drug money launderer because that's the kind of stuff we see them doing. 
So to, in, in order to end up from a They don't know that they're Islamists. They don't know they're Islamists. They don't know they're terrorists. They, they think they're a political party from Lebanon. or they, they're, they're misguided on the multidimensional nature of Hezbollah. So the terrorist designation uh, above the legal mechanisms, it allows us to have the same counterterrorism conversation. And so we're no longer having confusion as to what kind of terror networks exist in these specific countries. Right. And one, one point of amplification, because yeah. I think this is, this is hugely important. Um, and Joseph and I sort of experienced this as, uh, I, I think it was 2013, uh, 2013, where we were in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, having dinner with a journalist uh, who had just written a big expose about Al Qaeda's point man in Sao Paulo. And, you know, in the course of our, uh, uh, of our dinner, we were sort of uh, peppering him with questions. And one of the questions that we asked, and the answer would just completely floored us, was, where is he now? And the, the answer was, oh, he's here. He's got a business. He's got, a, you know, a, a small business, small electronics business down the street and this and that, which to us is incomprehensible. But that's what we need to understand about the permissive environment in Latin America. In Latin that's America. Al Qaeda. Okay. Ex exa no, exactly right. So, in the United States, in the 1990s, until the passage of a law called the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in 1996, you could get in trouble, not just for being a member of a terrorist group, but for being a member of a terrorist group and engaging in criminal activity in the service of that group. So being a member of Al-Qaeda uh, at, at that time would not have been enough to get you in trouble. You would have had to traffic drugs or traffic, uh, uh, traffic money or, or arms. And that is the environment that until very, very recently, Latin America has been operating in. And so that nexus that Joseph talked about, the trying to explain that being, uh, that this organization is bad per se, that it should be banned by itself, not just because it's engaged in drug trafficking, not just because it's engaged in criminality, even though that's, those are amplifying elements, but that these are bad actors, that's an understanding that didn't exist until very, very recently. And the more we can promote that understanding in the region, the less permissive of an environment uh, we can create for Al Qaeda, for Hezbollah, and for other radicals. That's unbelievable. I mean, to hear, you know, for somebody that uh, Al Qaeda affiliate would be uh, living normally, and people know that this person is affiliated with Al Qaeda in, in a country in Latin America. Talking about this, Elon, I want to know now Hezbollah is also struggling. Uh, with the whole economical situation, uh, with the uh, maximum pressure campaign by the American administration. And now we're expecting the Caesars bill and the law to pass, to become a law actively in the next few days. In your opinion, how much would that affect Hezbollah, the Iranian regime and Russia, countries were involved in supporting and helping the Assad regime? So I, I think this is a great question. And I think it gets to the same question that uh, you and I and everybody else were talking about, about Hezbollah involvement in Syria, which is it's clear that because Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy, uh, they are going to be involved in the Syrian civil war. But a lot of experts underestimated the extent to which Hezbollah would become involved because the Iranians wanted them to. And I think that's an important example to point out here because Hezbollah is, very clearly involved in Latin America. And Hezbollah has been involved in Latin America since the late 1980s, uh, but it has historically looked at Latin America as a theater for support activity, as a theater to uh, exploit uh, free trade zones, to move around money, to raise money through illicit activities that it could then bring back to the Middle East. But the more you see an operational presence uh, on the part of uh, these groups, the more you see an operational presence in the Western Hemisphere on the part of Iran, the more you have to be concerned that this support activity could become something else because Iran uh, is interested in having a presence in Latin America. Um, the thing that most people don't uh, sort of don't realize is that over the last dozen years, there have been at least three separate terrorist plots, thankfully that have been thwarted, but plots emanating from Latin America that were orchestrated by Iran that were intended to be carried, around, uh, carried out in the continental United States. Mm -hmm. So the idea that Iran is only in Latin America to move around some money or only in Latin America because there's anti-American regimes and there's really nothing to worry about, I think really misses the mark. Joseph, is Iran weakened in Latin America? Um, so let me... I think Iran's weak in generally. Uh, they, I think they have tremendous amount of challenges. Elon was mentioning the, the coronavirus uh, was not favorable to Iran. It was one of the three top countries that were affected outside of Asia. 
But I think there's something, uh, when I look at these regimes, and I, I include Russia in this, I include China in this as well. Um, when I look at these, the, these regimes, I, I, I think of something what, they, what we call the wounded dog syndrome. Uh, these are all weakened regimes in many respects, right? Uh, however, uh, a wounded dog doesn't necessarily just sit down and stay quiet. A wounded dog may actually bite more aggressively, thinking that the, the regime survival is at risk. Uh, in that, Venezuela is the best example of that. There's no weaker regime than Venezuela. The Maduro regime, you talk about currency not worth paper, that's the Bolivar in Venezuela. Inflation over 1 million percent. That literally means nothing, uh, the, their currency. But that doesn't mean Maduro is not going to do anything. And that doesn't mean there isn't an anti-fragility to the way the regime's constructs, especially as they unify. And it's that network that I think gives them that, that, that strength. Uh, in that, let me uh, make a point on Hezbollah, I think, uh, as it relates to Venezuela and Syria. So I think what we really learned with Hezbollah's uh, uh, defense of the Assad regime in Syria was how much that land bridge means to them uh, between Tehran and Lebanon, right? The ability to be able to courier weapons and uh, people and soldiers, they need that logistical corridor. And, and Assad protects that logistical corridor, which is why they're willing to protect Assad. So if we extend that thinking, which has kind of been evidenced over the last uh, several years, we take that thinking and bring it to Venezuela, well, Venezuela is the air bridge. That is also the, the, the logistical network that they need to be able to operate in the Western Hemisphere. So if they want to attack the United States, if they want to engage in aggressive actions against the United States, and not just in terrorism, but in all the elements of asymmetric war, they need that logistical space. Uh, losing Nicolas Maduro, or not just the individual, but losing the control of that through the regime means that they get set back many years, which is why they're going to be willing to defend. And many analysts, just like they got it wrong in Syria, many analysts are getting it wrong in Venezuela, saying Hezbollah is not going to defend the Maduro regime. Hezbollah doesn't have the capability. But if you start to study how long they've been there, the, the, the levels and layers of their networks, uh, how Iran is essentially acting in, in, in a very assertive manner, you begin to realize that this does matter to them. Uh, and I've said it in, uh, in, many, in many public forums that uh, outside of the, the near abroad, outside of the, the greater Middle East, Latin America to me is the most important region for Iran strategically because they understand something that uh, we have yet to give them uh, that, that benefit of the doubt, which is that the United States is their principal adversary. Uh, they understand their challenges in the Middle East with Israel, with Saudi Arabia and the Arab world, but they look left, they look right, they see the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they understand that the only way to defeat the United States is to threaten them in quote unquote our backyard the way they feel we were threatening in their backyard. So this is something very serious for Iran and a matter of the regime survival. So important. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about the fact that Israel has been the only country to confront the Iranian militias, for example, in Syria. And now there is some tension in northern Israel with Hezbollah. We know that the entire region is against Hezbollah. The people in Lebanon are protesting against Hezbollah. But what could that mean? And could we see an actual conflict between Israel and Hezbollah? Uh, in fact, I, I would go further. Uh, not uh, can we see, but we will see. Um, because, you know, the sort of the cycle that you see historically over the last dozen years or so is that this uh, uh, period of, you know, a period of, of heightened fighting followed by uh, what is essentially a Cold War, right? There's a reason why the Israelis call the current period um, of uh, relations with, Hez uh, with regard to Hezbollah, uh, with regard to Lebanon, as the campaign between wars, right? Because they they predict, they assume that there's going to be another flare up of conflict. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to level the playing field and create as much strategic depth as possible right now so that they are in a favorable position when that war inevitably breaks out. And here, there's one thing that is really, I think, a game changer. Uh, if you see what Israel has been doing in military terms, the types of installations it's been targeting, the types of uh, provocations from Hezbollah that have resulted in an Israeli response, what you're left with is a very clear understanding that precision guided munitions, these uh, highly sophisticated, accurate short range rockets that they're getting from Iran, the Israelis think this is the game changer. The Israelis think that if Hezbollah is allowed to get large quantities of these munitions, it will fundamentally alter the balance. And that's why Israel is acting more and more aggressively against Hezbollah outposts on its northern border, because it doesn't want a critical mass of that type of technology to be amassed there. And if Israel, sooner rather than later, decides to go to war, it will be over these growing capabilities on the part of Hezbollah. That's very important. Would you like to add anything, Joseph, to this? 
Um, well, yeah, just, you know, I think what uh, we're seeing in the 21st century is the amorphosis of what started mostly as regional conflicts. Uh, whatever we saw with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela was very much within the context of Latin America. What we saw with Iran and Hezbollah, the context of the Middle East, uh, China with Asia. And what we're seeing, especially in this latter decade, is the, the transition from regional conflicts to truly global conflicts. Global conflicts within the global nature of uh, great power competition. Russia and China keep being at the forefront of that because of their uh, economic and military uh, uh, ambitions. But nonetheless, Iran has very much aligned with that same vision, at least in the things Latin America, we see that. And one of the points I like to make with a lot of uh, folks that are new to Latin America is that uh, uh, the, the alliance of Iran, Russia, and China is more visible in Latin America perhaps than any part of the world. Uh, you see it at the economic level, you see it at the commercial level, you see it at the diplomatic level, and you obviously see it with proxy elements. Uh, I call it the three quarter standards. If you look at uh, three quarters of uh, Iranian bilateral agreements in Latin America, they're with the same four countries, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia. If you look at three quarters of Russian arms sales, which is a big part of their export economy, it's the same uh, four countries. Or three quarters of credits and loans from China, not investments, but credits and loans propping them up, it's from the same four countries. And a lot of that's manifested into Venezuela. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is the Iranian-China uh, nexus in Venezuela. China has a lot, and Russia, they have a lot of uh, control over the oil industry in, in, in Venezuela because of the loans that they have given the Chavez de Maduro regime over that industry. And now what we're seeing is Iranian oil going over to Russia and Chinese controlled uh, industries inside Venezuela. So that triangle is what's complicating the relationships and, and the nature of these threats in, in Latin America. And for the United States, it's no bigger challenge because we can uh, address and, and wrestle with all these challenges and, and they're near abroad. But it, when it gets into our neighborhood, it creates a, a magnitude of order that I think is much greater than what we've seen in the Middle East or other parts of the world. Thank you so much, both Elon Berman and Joseph Humeyer. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching uh, with you, Havy, and The Untold. And I would look forward to hearing your comments and your thoughts. And see you next time. <laughs>